There, folks, welcome, welcome, welcome again to another Tuesday night lecture. Uh, we have with us this evening uh, Joe Ryan from the IRTS, who's uh, joined us this evening. So, uh, welcome, Joe. Um, also, uh, if you are with us this evening on the Zoom and you haven't subscribed yet to our uh, YouTube channel, please do. You would help us out a whole lot if you hit the subscribe button and everything else. And uh, there's some videos there, some clips who are uh, really getting a lot of attention, not least by our own uh, George there on cables, connectors and uh, everything else there. It's uh, definitely worth a watch on our YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com and search for M-U-A-R-C and uh, that will bring up our channel. So, Joe, um, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself there, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and then you can, uh, the floor really is, or the screen now, the long run joke is uh, over to you. Yeah, okay, <clears throat> uh, thanks very much, Dave and Adita. Thanks for the invite. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, I mean, I, I recognize some of the, uh, the, the, the names on the screen there and uh, including, for example, Ian and Esther, I've worked them a few times, <laughs> but, uh, and uh, I think Philip as well. Okay, so I'm, I'm uh, Joe, my call sign is Echo India 7 Golf Yankee. Um, I also have the call sign Golf Zero Mike Papa Golf uh, with a, a station address in Yorkshire. Um, I, uh, I have relatives there and uh, worked that. I, I haven't actually used the, the Golf Zero call sign for many years because of the set. I can use uh, whatever it is, Mike uh, Stroke. Um, uh, but I have actually used uh, Golf India Zero, Mike Papa Golf, uh, in recent years from Rathlin Island. I did uh, the IOTA contest from Rathlin Island uh, a few years ago. Uh, in fact, two years running. Uh, one of my more successful uh, IOTA contests with, with a few others. Um, my, my initial interest in radio started back in the 1950s. I, I, like everybody uh, growing up in the, in the 40s and 50s, I wanted to listen to Radio Luxembourg, but we had one radio in the house and that was tuned to uh, Radio Earn. So um, you had to build your own. And I built, I, I started getting practical wireless uh, in 1951 and they had a nice little circuit there for a, a small little TRF, and, and I built that. Uh, but of course, it had no cell activity, so you could only pick up Luxembourg when uh, when Radio Earn shut down, which it did at about 10 o'clock. But uh, that sort of radio building uh, developed into an interest in electronics, generally more so than radios, and I moved on to things like clocks and timers. So I have lots of old circuits that I built with 555s, and I was a subscriber to Practical Electronics. I don't know if anyone here remembers that. It was a, a sister uh, magazine to Practical Wireless, but it did shut down many years ago. It was also a Dutch magazine, Elector. They, they published an English language version. And um, what I was going to say, that uh, uh, I, I built plenty of circuits from that. I got my amateur license in 1989. Um, my preferred mode on the radio has always been CW. I, I just do casual oper operating. I've, I've done a few contests, but uh, I did some DXing. I, uh, having got 240 countries or so uh, worked, uh, I just gave up because, uh, as everybody knows, it's the last 100 are, are difficult, and uh, I, I just don't have the patience. I've been an active uh, officer in IRTS since 1990, doing uh, various things for my sins. So that's about it, Dave, in terms of, of introductions. Um, I'm talking tonight about two, two sort of two separate things, maybe 15 minutes on each or so. Uh, firstly, I'll talk about IRTS contests. And the first thing actually I'd like to address on that is, is the market size, because we have a very small uh, market here. There are something like 1,700 EI amateur radio licenses in issue, um, but maybe, you know, uh, the, at the highest number of, of active amateurs in the country is probably about a thousand. Various efforts have been made to find out how many are active, but uh, it would be more like a thousand. It, it wouldn't be like the, the number of licenses an issue. I think that's the same in every country. So what proportion of those are interested in, in contests? 
Um, at a guess, I'd say less than 5%. It is a minority uh, sport. Uh, I'm not sure how many contesters we have, even among the, the people uh, listening tonight. Uh, but it would be, uh, you know, I, I'm the only contester I know in terms of the group of people that I uh, tend to knock around with here in the, in the local radio club. So uh, based on a random sample of that, it, it's one in 20 or less. So um, there may be something like 50 regular contesters in, in EI, uh, and that's not a very big number start mounting uh, contests and so on. In fact, today when I was um, working up some, uh, some data for this presentation, I had a look at, uh, let's say, the CQ Worldwide DX contest. That's one of the bigger contests that you know, a lot of contesters would aim to do. And if I, if I add together the, um, the CW and the SSB legs of the most recent versions of that contest, I get 35 different EI call signs. Now, a lot of them worked in groups, but if, if I just look at the individual call signs within the group, that's 35 people who took some sort of part in the CQ worldwide. And by the way, um, I, I also had a look at the GI figures. It would be about half that figure. Um, I had some difficulty getting an accurate figure because you have short um, uh, contest call signs and uh, there may be duplicates there. Um, you know, people doing the, using the contest call sign for one contest and the, uh, their own personal call sign there. But anyway, it's, it's maybe half that figure. I looked at a few other contests. The, um, I'm a great fan of the UK EI, CC, UK and EI contest club contests. Um, and they run uh, DX contests uh, twice a year, SSB once and CW. And uh, the thing about uh, the UK EICC DX contest is that the Irish counties are multipliers. And uh, I suppose it's the only truly international contest where Irish counties are multipliers. And uh, just 10 different EI call signs in the two most recent uh, UK EICC DX contests, again, I'm adding the, uh, the CW and the SSB together. Uh, and then finally, I looked at the fantastic series of contests that the RSGB ran, uh, the RSGB Hope contests. They ran series one and series two during the lockdown. I, I took part in, in most of the CW and some of the phone ones. And if I look at the two series, so that was over, I um, can't remember how many weeks, it was probably over 12 weeks or maybe more. And uh, all modes, they had CW, phone, uh, FT4, and RITI, uh, just seven EI call signs participated. And, and EIs do tend to participate in the uh, RSGB uh, uh, calls or uh, contests. So, I mean, the, the conclusion is it's a very, very small market for contests here in, in, in EI. And uh, I suppose the reason I'm, I'm starting off uh, talking about the market size is that it's quite a challenge for a small society like the IRTS to run meaningful contests, you know, given the, the few contesters. I mean, I've done the, the Polish contests. If there are other contest, contesters uh, here watching tonight, I'm sure some of them have done the Polish contest, like the number of Poles, you know, that, that participate. It's fantastic. I mean, okay, Poland's a big country, but I, I feel that without knowing the numbers, that as a proportion of the amateur population, they have a much higher proportion, much more active in, in contests. So, uh, so that's, the, that, that's, what, that's the background, as it were, to, to EI contests or to IRTS contests. So um, I have to look back to 2019, obviously, to, uh, to, to, to find a normal year. Uh, this was not a normal year for contests. So in 2019, we ran 12 contests. That was three IARU uh, Region 1 field days and nine counties contests. So as regards the field days, um, well, CW field day seems to have almost died here in EI. Uh, there was one single op entry in 2018. That was me. And there were two single op entries in 2019, and that was me and another. Um, so 
<laughs> I, uh, um, well, and it was known in, in 2020. SSB Field Day and VHF Field Day, uh, they fare a little better, they're a little more popular, but far less busy than I remember from the 1980s. Uh, in fact, the first time I ever had a microphone in my hand uh, talking on a radio was the 1988 SSB Field Day. Before I had a license, I uh, went out with uh, my club, the South Dublin Radio Club, and uh, we operated uh, from a field down in County Kildare. And uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I can't find the results of that contest, but I'm pretty certain there were upwards of eight or nine other groups around the country uh, entering the contest, and we were in competition with them. And I've no doubt that we didn't win. And um, so. As regards the field days, I mean, I don't mind admitting that the the reason IRT, the only reason that IRTS continues to support those contests is that they're, they are region one contests. Uh, they're popular in the UK. They're uh, po popular in Germany, Denmark, Belgium, some other continental European countries. And at least if we continue to promote them, I suppose there's the prospect that uh, the EI uh, call sign will provide a multiplier for, for someone. Uh, and I have found uh, the few times I've gone out, um, you know, when I work someone, particularly a German station, let's say on 20 meters, they want me to QSY to 15 and to 10 and to try all the different bands because, I mean, I may be the only EI out the air, the only EI they can hear. Um, I always enjoyed uh, putting up antennas in fields and, and all of that, but I, I I think that the excitement of putting up antennas in a muddy field and operating in a drafty tent just isn't, uh, it's not as attractive as it was. I think people are looking for something a little easier now, and, and they're probably looking for something easier uh, now myself. But anyway, it's for whatever reason, the field days are not as popular. Um, I, I've looked at some of the statistics from the RSGB um, contest. They're actually, I mean, they're holding up reasonably well. I, I suppose that the problem that we have in EI is that the numbers to start off with were so low that, you know, if you lose a few groups, um, you're down to something that isn't viable. I, I think it probably, I think if there was someone here, um, uh, you know, who knows something about the RSGB contest, they probably say they've also dropped, but they started off as well from a much, much higher, uh, yeah, not a much higher level. So uh, just to talk uh, about, uh, well, 2020 field days, that's easy. Um, CW field day, we uh, I canceled that. Uh, that. That would have been the first weekend in June. So that was a no brainer. Um, and likewise, uh, I canceled the VHF, UHF field day, which would have been the, uh, first weekend in July. Um, now, uh, we like the RSGB, we converted that into a, a series of fixed station contests, one for each band. And what I did was I, I was talking to Andy, the, uh, the, the, the VHF uh, contest manager in the RSGB, and we aligned the, the, the contest times and the bands with the RSGB. So at least there was, um, you know, there was a, a bit of DX to be worked uh, by them and by us. And um, unfortunately, actually on the day, uh, uh, conditions were quite poor. I mean, condition, you know, conditions around uh, a few days beforehand were quite good, uh, especially on six meters. But um, on the day, it was very, very flat. Um, there were some small openings on the Sunday morning. Uh, I worked a few GI stations, but uh, that that wouldn't really be DX uh, for the for, for that time of the year. Uh, and finally, we have SSB Field Day coming up on the 5th and 6th of September. Um, and I've had, I mean, it, it's still in the uh, in the contest calendar as it is in, on the RSGB website and the DARC website. Um, but I'm I'm waiting to see who jumps first. I I don't think it's going to happen. Um, and as uh, you guys would know or the guys from GI and, the, and there's a few from EI I see there too. Um, I mean, we've had a lockdown in some counties uh, already, um, you know, which was initially for two weeks, but it'll probably last longer. And in fact, they include um, my favourite contesting counties, uh, Leash and Offaly. Um, 
Ian and Esther will, will know that they've worked me there uh, from Leash or from Offaly uh, a number of times. It's right in the middle of the country. So, um, so uh, I, I think the people in those counties can't leave and the people outside the counties are not supposed to go into them. So uh, anyway, I, I don't think SSB Field Day is going to happen, but I've left it there for the time being until I see what happens uh, ac across the water. So that's I, I just thought I would deal uh, with the with the field day contests first. Uh, I mean, I suppose the, the summary of that is they're not particularly important for us, but we we, we retain them, um, you know, for for what it's worth. And that really leaves the counties contest because I think probably indeed, uh, Dave, when, when you were you know asked me to say something about contests, you you were probably thinking of the counties contest rather than the field days. Um, the I mean I don't know when the counties contest started. Um, they, they they were in existence when when I uh, joined IRTS in uh, you know thirty years ago or whatever. Um, initially, I know they were two meter contests. They, they were two two meter events, always one on Easter Monday, and then either in August or September. And um, when I started doing them in nineteen ninety. They were cumulative events, um, you know, with the scores from Easter added to the, the score from the autumn contest, uh, which was, uh, it might have seemed like a good idea at the time, but um, I know it certainly annoyed me. I, I was generally free on Easter Monday, but um, I often went on holidays in September, so um, I missed out the, the second one. Uh, sometime in the 1990s, before I became involved as contest manager, they, uh, they, they, they were turned into separate uh, events. Um, all, two, all 32 counties on the island have been multipliers. I, I assume from the very beginning, certainly when I came across it, but when I was doing it in the late 80s and early 90s, there would be just occasional call-ins from GI but no logs um, that I can remember anyway coming in from GI. I mean, people, if, if they heard someone on, they'd give a call and it was a multiplier as far as we were concerned. Uh, but uh, there was no, no active participation. So um, I think to encourage that, um, my predecessor as contest manager, uh, TOS CI2JD, who would be known to, to some people uh, who are listening there, he sort of changed it to 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 introduce um, separate, uh, you know, uh, awards for GI stations, and that did lead to a, an increase in, in in GI submitting logs and GI stations uh, participating. And then there've been various other changes. I mean, initially it was um, primarily an SSB event. I suppose in up to the early 1990s, uh, or maybe even later, uh, you know. SSB on two meters was a big thing. Um, there was an FM only section added then at, at some stage. I can't remember exactly when. Uh, it has now actually become almost an FM contest, and SSB is the uh, the, the sort of the minority, the, the junior partner, shall we say? Um, but you know, in order to encourage both modes, um, the the rules were changed so that you could work someone on FM and then you could say, you know, are you on SSB and work you on SSB. So, you know, that's a, uh, it's unusual thing for contest to be able to work people. Well, I suppose not necessarily the outer contest. I think you can work people on both modes. So anyway, that, that was brought in. And then finally, and I was involved in this, we, we got some suggestions from people to have a 70 SEMS contest. And I wasn't keen to have people, um, climbing up mountains and so on, just for 70 SEMs alone. But uh, someone came up with the idea that, uh, well, why not have it, uh, you know, just before the two meters contest. So we have a 70 SEMs contest now. Uh, it was originally an hour uh, uh, be before the two meters contest, now just 30 minutes. So it's a county's contest. It has the very same rules as uh, um, as the uh, the two meters event. So if, if uh, I suppose a lot of, uh, rigs nowadays whether they be handhelds or even the the the, the rigs like the um the you know the a's of the eight nine whatever the eight one seven and the age one age that sort of thing they, they have uh, fm and ssb so i think people are happy to work both modes the scoring 
in our county's contest, which I inherited from my predecessors and I was afraid to change, um, is, I mean, it, it's, it probably makes a lot of sense, but it's, uh, I, I'll, come, <laughs> I'll come to scoring the logs in a minute. It, uh, it can make life difficult for the, uh, for the contest manager. Um, it's one point for working uh, the county that you're in, uh, two points for working an adjoining county, and six points for working a non-adjoining county, and one point for working a station outside of EI or GI. And stations outside of EI and GI get four points per QSO. So I feel like saying repeat all that after me and see who's see who's awake. Um, and actually, one of the things that I discovered early on when, when I uh, got involved in in scoring the contest was uh, what's a, an adjoining county. And um, I uh, there are a number of uh, of uh, I won't say dubious one, but I mean, I know what an adjoining county is because if, if the border is on land or river or a lake, it's adjoining. But uh, to take uh, um, GI geography, I mean, Antrim and Tyrone in, in our book are adjoining counties. But I think, you know, people would say, no, they're not adjoining. You, 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 uh, you have to drive around <laughs> through another county to get there. But of course, if you look on the map carefully, you'll see that the Antrim and Tyrone borders do actually meet in the middle of the lake. So uh, th there was a similar problem between Waterford and Wexford or something like that. People were arguing, you know, the only way to get from one to the other is to go by boat. I said, yeah, that's fine. Well, then they're adjoining. So anyway, I published a list of adjoining counties on the website in order to try to deal with that. Um, when I, uh, when I, you know, I'm, I'm talking about scoring and so on, and actually I'll, I'll come back to that um, later. I, I'll just run through the remaining counties contest, but uh, I've had a bit of fun with uh, trying to, to score contests where the logs are, um, are mainly handwritten. So anyway, the counties contests, uh, the, as I said, started off as two meter only events. They were extended to HF um, January 2006. I had to look up my old uh, newsletters to find that out. Uh, 80 meters, it was an 80 meters uh, contest on the 2nd of January 2006 was, was the first one. And it was quite popular, um, more popular than the two meter events. For the first one, there were 40 something logs and the following year there were 60 something logs. And in fact, in the New Year's Day 80 meters contest um, this year, um, we got uh, 47 logs. So it, it's probably the, the best supported um, uh, IRTS contest in the contest calendar. So we fixed it. It's New Year's Day now, irrespective of, of what day uh, the, the 1st of January is. Um, we had an 80 meters contest sometime in June also, um, but uh, trying to uh, to get 80 meters to work locally, uh, you know, near Midsummer's Day just simply wasn't working. I, so I abandoned it a few years ago. Um, we were getting, you know, uh, just no propagation whatsoever. Uh, it was too much daylight. Um, we, we have, we've added uh, a number of, we've added two 40 meters counties contests um, at a time when 40 meters was better than it is now, it's it's been quite disappointing uh, of late, uh, as everybody who's on 40 meters would know. And um, we added uh, some 80 meters evening counties contests. I was copying the, I, I talked about the UK EICC there, that they started a series of one hour evening uh, contests on 80 meters that were really popular among uh, G stations and among EI stations and continental Europe now is, is catching on to it. So, so I decided to, to jump on the bandwagon as it were and I had, uh, I, I've had added two 80 meters evening contests. Um, in fact, you know, overseas stations have become more important in our contest. Well, as we've developed our HF contesting thing, the overseas stations became more important and also short skip has been quite poor of late on, on some of the uh, 40 meters contests. Uh, I, in fact, I was down in Leash doing one about 18 months ago and I could really work no one in Ireland at all, but I worked quite a lot of continental European guys. I mean, the skip was just about right for, um, you know, for uh, Western Europe, but well, certainly for the yeah, uh, Belgium and Netherlands and so on. So we, uh, we added, um, overseas DXCC entities as multipliers. 
and we also introduced uh, separate uh, sections for overseas stations so they're not you know they're, they're competing among one another rather than uh, than with the sort of EI and GI stations so th that leaves the contest I mean I mentioned there were 12 and again I'm talking about a normal year so we've three field day contests we have two 70 sems contests for 30 minutes we've two two meter contests they're 90 minutes each so the 70 sems and the two meters that's up to two hours of contesting for people that want to do both we've the 80 meters new year's day contest which is two hours we've two 80 meters evening contests one hour march and october and two 40 meter daytime contests also an hour may and october um, i like short contests myself um, i've in the same way as i mentioned earlier in the personal introduction that i had sort of lost interest in uh, or lost patience in trying to get the last hundred uh, dxcc entities I, I i've lost interest in spending 24 hours at the key uh, now um, and um or 48 hours well i mean I, i've spent more than 24 at one stage for in a 48 hour contest um but from from the point of view of someone who who wants to promote contesting in Ireland, I think I find that you know the short contests and most of them are in our are thereabouts. They will attract operators that just wouldn't be interested in uh, contesting in contests otherwise. But you know for an hour, they think sure why not? And it also avoids um, sort of aggro and you know we you know no one could complain that we're clogging up the band, um, you know when it's just an hour. Um, I have, you know, occasionally people will come on and say, oh yeah, there's an, an EI contest. And then someone else, oh yeah, well, it's only an hour. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, uh, and I mean, certainly for anyone who's active on two meters or 70 sounds, there's not, I mean, I think probably we'd wish people would clog up the bands sometimes. Um, it, uh, it, it's a bit quiet. It's certainly very quiet here. Okay. Um, Staying with contests, I said I'd come back to, to, to logs and logging and scoring. Um, one of the objectives, as I had mentioned, was to encourage non-contesters just to have a go. I'm not trying to convert them into CQWW contesters or anything like that, but just to you know, get more people on the air and, and keep the bands active. I mean, that is, is fairly important from our point of view. So to do that, um, we accept logs really in any form, you know, provided it contains the key data. We're not looking for Cabrillo logs. Um, there's no point in looking for, uh, you know, Cabrillo logs for our county's contest because um, there is one a logging program, uh, Paul O'Kane. Uh, anyone's familiar with him, he's written uh, SD Super Duper, and that does work for, um, it's really designed for the HF county's contest. You, you can juggle around a little bit with the modes. Uh, uh, and the frequencies for a VHF counties contest, but um, you know what I found is that people, are, a lot of people, are happy to enter contests, but they have absolutely no intention of getting into computer logging in some cases, or they have no intention of switching from Logger Thirty Two or whatever their their favourite log is. And I mean, that's they're just not designed to record, you know, uh, five and nine oh three. County Tyrone or whatever. So, um, so I mean, I, we've made a point of saying we will accept, uh, you know, con we prefer it in electronic format if it's a, a spreadsheet or a word file, but we also accept photos of pages torn out of jotters and, you know, particularly with uh, cameras on phones now. I do get a lot of, uh, of logs, which is just a page from a jotter and the, uh, and the data, and provided the data is there, uh, I mean, there aren't. I mean, we're talking about twenty or thirty or forty QSOs. It's no big deal to sort of for me to type it up, um, and we do get some Cabrillo logs. The the spreadsheets and the word files, I can reformat that fairly easily into what I'm calling a quasi Cabrillo format uh, using just text manip manipulation software. In other words, I can pick the co the columns and move them around to the to the order in which I want them in. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't, all of our contests, and I'm not talking about the field days now, all of our county's contests are, are over short periods. So I don't bother with time. I'm not testing, does, I'm not seeing, does one person record it at 12.10, the other one record it at 12.15 or something like that. It's of no interest to me. I don't record times. And uh, 
here I'm going to admit publicly for the first time, I don't, I don't check signal reports, but I don't think anyone else does either. Um, you know, it's five and nine, five, nine, nine. Um, I, I, I would have experienced myself um, re recording um, signal reports that people had sent me on the two meters contest, you know, when I was, uh, um, when I was doing them years ago, you know, I had to be recording faithfully five and three, five and three. And then, you know, Toss or whoever was the contest manager would say, oh, he, he just said five and nine for everything. So, so it's five and nine. Uh, so therefore, I mean, that enables me to, you know, I'm looking for a short form uh, a log really, you know. Um, so then I've written software myself then that, you know, it, it, once I have them all in this standard, uh, I'm calling it quasi Caprilo format, uh, I can cross check them and I can score them, uh, applying the sort of rather odd scoring thing. That, that scoring thing I mentioned about adjoining counties and all that, that only applies to the, the VHF contest. The, the HF contest is fairly simple. You, it, you know, you just get a point for, for working someone and each county is a multiplier. There aren't extra points for uh, working someone who's, um, uh, you know, who's, who's not adjoining you because in fact, it's sometimes easier. In fact, it's often easier to work someone from, from far away. Excuse me. And then, so th that's after I produce uh, a results spreadsheet, um, a CSV file, and that's pretty easy to convert into a, a web page. So summing up on contests, the, the first part of my presentation, um, I think we in IRTS know that, that we're not in the big league in terms of contest organizers. Um, we have, as, but we have the, the region one field days, they're still there. Um, albeit not uh, necessarily supported. Um, we have single band counties contests for 70 cents, for two meters, for 40 meters, and for 80 meters. Um, the HF contests within that, the 40 and 80 meter things, have become, uh, well, I call them mini international contests. You know, I mean, they're contests where the island of Ireland is the focus because an Irish station has to be at one or both ends of the QSO. So, you know, it's it's actually getting quite popular and in fact in a, a recent 80 meters evening contest we held a, a, a an extra 80 meters evening contest uh, in april it was in the middle of the lockdown and we just threw in an extra one there there were 13 uh, overseas dxcc entities in the logs okay that would have included um g gm uh, gw and probably gj but then the rest were continental europe uh, we didn't have any Japan or North America or anything like that, but you know, it was um, call them European trans-European contests. They, for those who have have done them, they are much more relaxed than the typical contest. I mean, certainly infinitely more relaxed than the AWRL or um, the CQWW contests that are just all business and, and so on. And you know, anyone who has done contests has. You know, okay, so they've done that, and, and the the aim is just to work as many QSOs as possible. I found with the um, with the counties contest, in fact, the the frustrating thing sometimes being, you know, you're there and you you hear someone in a county you haven't worked, and you say, oh yeah, yeah, I'll I'll hang around here and and work him, and they're having a chat with someone about something or other. You know? <laughs> it's, but I mean, that's you know, I, I I see that as a positive, but I mean. Uh, a, a true contester might say, you know, this is ridiculous, but uh, but anyway, it's all part of the fun. And it, it does give people a taste of contesting. It has probably helped to bring some people into contesting, but but even if it doesn't, you know, we're not trying to make permanent contesters or long-term contesters out of people. It just gets more people on the air. And it's a good all-island of Ireland sort of activity, you know, where... Um, you know, we're of equal value to each other in terms of multipliers and so on. So that is that. I think, Dave, will I carry on and deal with the um, with the exams thing, and then you know, if people want to to uh, to talk about uh, uh, either thing, or, I mean, or alternatively, you know, uh, you know, there can be questions or comments. Now, I I, I don't mind. Well, um. um... <laughs> I think I think you're being very hard on yourself there when you talk about IRTS contests not being big players. I know up on this side of uh, uh, the the border here, uh, we would very much look forward to IRTS contests, especially in uh, our club. You know, we would always sort of um, 
tell each other. There's the IRTS contest on, and a lot of people love getting involved in the counties contest up here. Um, it's definitely something we all look forward to. I, I must uh, make a note, though. I am also a very guilty party, Joe, when you say about getting involved in counties contests but not sending in the logs. And if I'd have known you accept a mobile phone photograph, boy, goodness me, I'd have been sending you photographs every time they were on. Right. I think it's I think it's been a bit of apathy for me more than anything. I can't yeah. be bothered sorting out the log. Um, if you're happy enough to take questions or anything on those contests or anyone wants to mention anything, then you, you, you know, completely... Feel free yeah, it's focus. probably easier to do that now, and then I move on to the uh, to the license exams. Yeah, yeah. So if anyone has any uh, comments or, or questions there on the contest uh, side of things, and feel free, feel free. Yeah. I'd just like to make a comment, uh, Joe. I have taken part in some of the county contests two and seven. They now haven't done the forty or eighty. Well, forty would probably be easier, but I just do it for the fun and to give a multiplier because. Not always somebody on from twenty to one, and just give a multiplier to guys. And I just think it's good fun. Yeah. By no means am I a contester. I'm also not one that complains that the bands are full all weekend with contesters. But I, I certainly don't like this. You're five nine. What's your name again for the log? Or you know, <laughs> I can't have that. Either give a true report or don't, because it yeah. lets you know how you're well. You're but the, I, I have to say, the IRTS, I haven't. I'm guilty. I'm not taking part in none of the CB short contest, but uh, I do enjoy the counties contest because they actually fall in base when you have maybe a bit of free time to do them. So keep up the good work, Joe. Okay, yeah. And I don't, I don't submit a log either, but maybe I might think about it. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, we have to have a penalty for people that don't send it. <laughs> well, you should say to the stations that are working those that don't send the log, it doesn't count unless the other person sends on a log. <laughs> then we might get a bit of abuse. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do. I mean, um, uh, you well for people that have submitted logs previously and maybe don't for one contest, I do drop them a little email and say, you, you know. Uh, a day or two before the deadline, you know, would you like to send in the log? Um, we, we have a two-week uh, deadline for logs, which is very much against the grain now. Uh, my old friends, the, the UK EICC, for, for their um, uh, contests in the evening, they have a one-hour deadline. <laughs> that's about tight. That's about tight. I see well, uh, Mr. Evans shaking his head. He must be one of the guilty ones. They got the email reminder. They get the log in. I, I think I probably have sent him the odd email, yes. <laughs> But I might, there's no point, I'm not doing it to be compelled, I just do it for the crack of the time, got the hole or something, but, you yes. know, I'm, I'm never going to win a contest, but then you don't know, like, you know, some of the 70 cents or something, you never know, but I it's, have all for, to, it's all for the crack. I have to congratulate you, Joe, because you do a sterling job, particularly with the counties contest, they are so much fun, I know Esther, she stays at home on New Year's Day, and I yeah. go up to Benbrada Mountain and yeah. we have a tremendous afternoon's crack and fun. And as you say, it's more a chat sometimes with the stations that you regularly do work. But you have to be congratulated for the amount of work that you put into it for the score and etc. I came across a wee logger program called Sukum Logger and uh, actually used it uh, for a couple of the contests. Yeah. And it was Jonathan, I think maybe the... Um, over in the uh, in the mainland, and I actually asked uh, him to have a look at the counties to add the counties into it, and I think he's actually done that as well. Okay. Uh, but we really do enjoy it, mm -hmm. and we appreciate the emails because <laughs> it's a good reminder for us. With that busy, sometimes we forget there. Busy or, or getting on in years, yeah. Well, True. <laughs> You're just messing the logger there. I don't know if any of these. I've started using it. I find it very simple and very easy. Uh, can't mind his call now, TM something. I can't even mind his name. Cloud log. It's very, very good. You can use it in your mobile, tablet, anything. It's, it's very, very good. Cloud log. Uh, most of details. I'll look it up here now. It's, uh, it is a wee subscription, but it's very small. But it does. M0 SQL. That's it. Uh, what's his name again? He's a big satellite, uh, satellite guy, but it links into all the satellite stuff and all. It's a great wee logging program, you know, and you're supporting a small man, as I say, by 
subscribe. Four pound a month, I think I pay for it, which. Yeah, I know. I I've, I often look at. I mean, I did some SOTA, um, uh, some summits on the air on and off, and so I, I look at the SOTA website or whatever it is, the discussion thing every now and then. There seems to be great interest among the SOTA activators in the sort of logs that work on tablets and mobile phones, all right, and that's understandable. But um, yeah, there's a there's a great Australian one that VK Portalog. VK Portalog. Uh, which works on any sort of mobile device for soda, but uh, for contesting, it's not really geared for contesting. It's more for soda and for GIFF for flora and fauna uh, and all the other different portable sort of events that you have. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's really, really good. The EI. Uh, ones at the one hour i love the one hour ones because as you say joe uh, it sort of appeals to more people that you don't have to give up 24 hours of your life yeah. uh, whenever we were young we used to sit up all night and mm, yeah we took part in those ones took part in those and esther used to do the YL. the yl ones as well yeah. which were big in america uh, but uh, we haven't we, ha we, we like our beauty sleep now too much to do that <laughs> And actually, you just reminded me, Ian, that, um, you know, in relation to the, the field days, um, we, we have six hour sections now, as well as the 24 hour section. Um, I, I don't think it was an original idea. I, I think I borrowed that from the RSG, or certainly from some other contest group um, that, uh, and I have my recollection, I haven't got the, uh, the, the computer open here with the with the results but uh, i i would say i think there are more people uh, to the extent that they are entering field days here in ei that they're they're putting in six hour logs because it means you don't have to spend stay out overnight but uh, yeah again more evidence that it's we're all looking for shorter contests an easier life <laughs> and do you know what's also great joe discussions like this uh, especially when you're coming along you know it sort of reminds me of there's, there's nothing to stop me from. <laughs> there's, there's a long running joke, Joe. Uh, I love sodas, the ones you can drive up the very top, you know, and you don't, you don't have to walk, you don't have to climb or anything like that. But even for the likes of the counties that are still going on the one hour evenings, there's nothing to stop me from going up uh, and driving up to somewhere high and, and activating and everything else um, and uh, getting involved in evening counties contests and everything else. Uh, and, you know, I think sometimes in for someone who isn't a contester, submitting the log seems, oh, that's, that's a, a whole lot of hassle having to submit the log and blah, blah, you know. But you've actually made it, taken away all the jargon and made it a wee bit simpler, you know. So uh, it's sort of kicking me into into action of, ah, I must get involved in the next one then and, uh, um, you know, give away a few points, but submit the log, you know, and actually get involved. Um, so all I'm saying is for everyone listening, uh, the next counties contest, uh, Sleeve Galleon's mine. Don't be going near that. I, I'm going up there. <laughs> Which is one yeah, of our we highest actually, ones we, we can drive up to, Joe. <laughs> yeah, actually, you, you remind me, there was, a, it was um, we have the two meters one, as you know, on, on Easter Monday. And Easter Monday, two or three years ago, um, was, it was very snowy. I can't remember precisely which year, but it was, it was very recently. And I decided I would go to Ardairn, um which is in the Schlee Blooms. It's on the, the border, I mean, literally on the border between Leash and Offaly, two of the counties that are now locked down. And I was driving up, but I, I, there was snow on the road and I just lost confidence. So I pulled in to a, a, a small forest car park and I operated from there. And I contacted um, one of my, uh, my friends uh, who actually was on our there. And uh, he, he, younger, younger chap than me, and uh, he, he had gone up to our there and for the contest. So I'm just as glad that I did, well, didn't go there because, you know, on two meters, two, you can't really operate within a, even, a, even a few hundred meters of someone else. So it would have been a case of whoever got there first. So a bit like you in, in future, maybe, you know, we should announce I'm going here or I'm going there or whatever. 
I'll be there from nine o'clock in the morning, and I'll have my barbecue out and my, and, and everything. <laughs> you have to have an online registration system. <laughs> and I go the night before. First yeah. there, first come, first come, first serve, Dave. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Well, any well, other I'm, other questions there, or anything before we we move on to the the licensing part? Yeah. Hi, Terry. G three VFC precincts all. And sorry to have only been there in uh, in sound earlier, but uh, here I am in the shack, much better. So I've heard it all, Joe, and um, I was intrigued that you uh, took part in your first contest uh, before you were, uh, before you had your ticket. And I do, I fervently believe, but most people don't agree with me that uh, having one or two contests under your belt. Uh, would be a good prerequisite to getting your license. And the reason I say that is because it gets rid of the uh, what do I talk about, will I be a silly, and um, I'm only an M7 or an EI, whatever you have. Um, it just, it's a level playing field. If you can talk, and if you've got two sentences to string together, 5973 being both of them, um, it just seems to me it's a wonderful way to get somebody away from being Mike shy. And uh, I wonder if people might take that one on board. Yeah, I mean, and in fact, I, I go, I mean, maybe for it. Well, I, 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 okay, I wouldn't make it a prerequisite to get a license, but, but still taking your point in, in terms of it being a very useful way to, to learn a few things. The, the other thing that we would have learned is just operational procedures. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if only just the band edges, because I mean, people, you know, the, the rig that we were using at the time, it wasn't one of these modern ones that goes beep, you know, when you when you go past the band edge, you could just, you know, go out on any frequency and you'd have people shouting at you like, that's not a frequency, <laughs> you know, that's not an amateur frequency. So you got to learn the frequencies pretty early on. You got to know which bands, you know, contest, contests were on. And there was also the, the, the fun, I, I think I was brought down there uh, to Kildare that time because I had a um, a tow bar on my car and they wanted stuff <laughs> towed down. Um, yeah, I had a caravan at the time. Um, they wanted stuff towed down. And, you know, it was a great um, learning in terms of putting up antennas and getting antennas to work, uh, you know, in, in field day type situations. So, I mean, not just the, the point, Terry, that you're making about, you know, what to say, but I mean, just how to set up a station yep. uh, and how to operate and, and, it, and all of that. So it's all uh, there. Yeah, it's absolutely I mean, all there. It, it's a brilliant, and, and I suppose maybe maybe it's I'll be talking about the exams in in a minute. And you know, I think I am finding that people are are coming into the exam, and uh, some of the answers they give are extraordinary. You know that that you're just thinking, you know, these people, you know, they know nothing. Sort of. Well, it's not they know nothing, but I mean, you know, mm -hmm. they they have fairly fundamental sort of errors that that anyone with any experience wouldn't make. And I'm not talking about difficult maths or anything like that. Yeah. So, um, so, so yeah, I mean, your, your general point, yes, but I, I, uh, I mean, there are so many different ways, I suppose, of, of learning. It, it's one, it, it's, it's the one that I had and it's one of the better ones. I totally agree with you. Yeah. I, I did not have it, unfortunately, but, um, uh, I heard you say it and I, yeah. I do, um, very little contesting, but the UK AEC, I used to do and I do look for now uh, due to uh, neighbor difficulties. Um, but it, not only does it give you all the experience that you've mentioned and the um, what you've got to say in a reasonably uh, coherent manner, but after the contest, the day after, the week after, it's giving you something to talk about rather than how many knobs on your handheld. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank, oh, thanks for the talk, uh, Joe. Very good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Dave. Will I move on to the uh, the second part, the second topic? Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good indeed. Work away, Joe. Yeah. Okay. So, so in fact, when when you um, uh, contacted me a few months ago, or a few, whatever it was, uh, six eight weeks ago, about the thing. You were saying the other topic would be, you know, the IRTS exams. So, I, I, uh, I uh, when I sent you an email there uh, a few days ago, I said, no, no I'm talk going to talk about license exams in EI, and uh, that's a very deliberate uh, 
change, okay, in, in, in the topic, because there's no such thing as the IRTS exams. Um, in, in EI, we have Comreg exams. Yeah, Comreg is the uh, EI equivalent of Ofcom. Um, we, we have a, a contract with Comreg, Comreg where we set and organize exams in EI, and our role is, is limited. It's to arrange the dates of the exams. Um, we, we consult with Comreg. I mean, they, they don't really mind, but, but uh, according to the contract, we have to get prior approval to organize an exam. We book the venues and pay for the venues. Um, we liaise with the candidates, um, send them all the documentation and so on. We, we draft the exam papers and we submit them to Comreg for approval. The, the papers, they, they approve the papers. They, they do have changes sometimes. Um, yeah, we, we manage the exams on the day. They, they, don't, they don't ever participate in managing the exam. And then we mark the papers and we send the papers and the results uh, to Comreg and uh, Comreg takes it from there. So um, this is quite different to the situation that uh, you have, for example, in the UK, uh, Dave, where, you know, for the purpose of getting a license, Ofcom have agreed that they will recognize uh, the results of RSGB exams. They are RSGB exams, um, uh, unlike the situation that we have in EI. And I think, I'm not absolutely so. I mean, I've seen the, the, the contract documents between um, RSGB and, and Ofcom, so that's how I can, can speak uh, definitely on that. I haven't seen the equivalent paperwork in relation in, in, for example, in the USA, but I'm fairly certain that the, is it the FCC, the federal, whatever, the communications commission, that, that they are recognizing exams set by the ARRL or some body associated with ARRL. In other words, I don't think the FCC is the examining body, but I, I could be wrong. So, I mean, th this difference, it, it's not just the semantics. Um, like it is important, you know, and it does explain, for example, why IRTS doesn't have the power to conduct exams outside of EI. And we've been asked um, on a number of occasions to hold exams, in fact, in, uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, you know, and we have, you know, you know well, we, we haven't, we, we, we've refused. We were also asked quite recently to hold exams in Amsterdam of all places. There was a group there for whatever reason. And the people there were saying, but like, you know, for God's sake, ARRL hold exams in London. Why can't you, you know, come over and hold them here? So it's a bit difficult, you know, in a, in a short email or a telephone exchange to explain it, but I, I've tried to explain it now. It, it's quite a different sort of setup. So just, so, so that's just the, the background. That, that, that's why I changed the title, uh, uh, Dave. You, you, you probably guessed because I, I, I got that from your email that you were, you, you were clued in on that. Yeah. Okay, so the, the license exam here in EI was a composition type exam up to 2005. Uh, and that's, that wasn't very popular. In fact, when I went in 1988 to, to go for an exam, I took the city and guilds exam. Um, I, I went up to Dundalk, uh, the Dundalk Technical College there, whatever they call themselves, uh, ran the city and guilds radio exam there twice a year. And I, I, I sat that simply because it was multiple choice and that was recognized by the, uh, the post office as, as it was here, who were the, uh, the licensing authority. Um, like I was a long time out of school and I didn't really fancy, you know, writing a composition about, um, a 40 meter antenna for some reason you know as as we were learning about radio amateur everybody said oh yeah it'll definitely come up in the exam you know uh, you know describe you know the construction of a four or an antenna for 40 meters but anyway um so it, the, the the composition type was a, was a very unpopular format and the availability of exams was highly irregular. I can remember an 18 month period uh, sometime after I got my license when there were no exams because there were no examiners. They had all retired and some of them were, you know, were prepared to come back. Uh, and then I think they made an arrangement with the marine surveyors, uh, you know, who had some people with technical knowledge to do the exam, but it just simply wasn't working. And in fact, the, 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 the safety valve, as it were, in EI was the city and guilds exam, but that ceased, uh, 
as you would know, in 2003. Um, I assume that had something to do with the, was it the Radio Communications Foundation or something? There, there was some RSGB linked organization took over the exams around then um, before RSGB itself took them. So early in the, two, shortly after 2003, Comreg, the, the regulator looked for um, proposals to administer the exams IRTS uh, put in a proposal and it was accepted. Um, so we ran one composition type exam. Oh yeah, the proposal was to run a multiple choice exam, but we, we didn't have a question pool or anything. So we ran one composition type exam in June, 2005, and then the first multiple choice exam uh, the following January in 2006. Um, so the multiple choice, the, the uh, structure of it it's always been 60 questions the structure has changed slightly over the years but currently it's uh, 60 questions it's divided into two sections section a is the radio regulations and we've deliberately put the regulatory thing as section a because in, in many respects it's more important than the well it, it, let's say it's just as important i think when i did the city and gills it was about 75 percent maybe 80 percent uh, sort of radio theory and then there was a tiny amount of regulatory stuff. The regulatory stuff is now 50%, it, certainly in, in our exam here in EI. So the radio regulations covers things like licensing additions, operating rules and procedures, EMC and safety. Section B then is the radio theory, and that's components, circuits, feeders, antennas, propagation, measurements. Uh, the pass rate is 60% and you must get a pass in both sections. Uh, so we've run now, um, since IRTS took over, run 46 exam sessions and all, and um, an average of about 12 uh, candidates per session. Sometimes it's been more, um, sometimes it's been a good bit less. Um, the late Sean Olin, EI7 CD, that I, I know would be known to, to, to some of you there. I, I, uh, I, Philip, you'd know him and, and a few others. He was the main mover behind the IRTS involvement in exams and Sean handled the admin and while I developed the question pool and drafted the exam papers and we also had uh, Sean Donlan, uh, EI4GK, again he'd been on to a number of people there and he was also involved in the admin. So uh, Sean Nolan died a few years ago and since then I've been doing both jobs um, and I, okay I call in help when needed on exam days but otherwise I've been uh, doing the admin and the, and the papers. So that's the sort of the, the background and, and the structure of the exams. I just talk a little bit about the licensed classes or class singular in Ireland because people tend to have strong views about this. There's only one licensed class in EI and that's the equivalent of the advanced license. Um, it's, it's a matter of public knowledge that Comreg is not keen on additional licensed classes. Uh, and in 2016, IRTS, well, I think in 2015, IRTS made a submission looking for the introduction of a novice license and they responded. And actually, I just want to read a few things. This is sort of fairly important for, for anyone that's, that's maybe watching this on YouTube later or something like that, or, or the, people, uh, the, the people present uh, tonight. So Comreg indicated that the current syllabus and exam structure is the minimum required to ensure that licensees have an adequate knowledge of the rules pertaining to the use of the amateur radio spectrum, the procedures that must be followed, and basic technical knowledge to prevent interference to other services in the spectrum utilized by the amateur radio service. In the light of all of these, Comreg is not in a position to license persons who cannot meet these minimum requirements. So the only reason I'm reading that out is I know that um, you know, when we have discussions about this in, in other forums here and in the EI, you know, it feels, ah, you know, they, they were just in that forum that day, just, you know, ask them again and so on. But they were pretty specific and in, in, in writing. So, um, I mean, I, I'm not saying that they would never change their mind, but they have quite a strong view on, uh, on the, 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 the novice license. And the novice license, by the way, would be the equivalent of the intermediate license in the UK. Um, the entry level license, I think, is is probably the equivalent of the foundation license. So, so there that stands. There that lies now. Anyway, that that was four years ago. Yeah. Things may change in the future. Um, 
the pass rate in EI is typically over 50%. Uh, it, it has been lower sometimes. Um, it, it's, it seems quite low as a pass rate for exams. Now, I, I've no uh, experience as to what exam pass rates should be, but it's actually not out of line with the pass rate for the advanced license in the UK. I'm almost certain I read in some RFGB document very recently that on the advanced license it was 54% or 50 something percent. Um, it, it's much higher, I know, for the other license classes. So it's, um, it, it's the figure seems low to me, but that, that's what it is. And I know that, um, you know, those who don't pass the exam may say it's too difficult or there should be an entry level license. But um, I would have to say, as the person who, who corrects the papers in the first place before passing them on, that what I see when I look at some of the papers is candidates who, you know, who haven't done the preparation. Um, and I think there may be an expectation that, you know, the Harrick exam is easy and, you know, it's, it's not easy. It's uh, that those of us who've, who've been through that, you know, the advanced or the, the equivalent will know that there's a fair bit of learning needed. It's, it's, it's a worthwhile thing. It's not rocket science, but, um, but neither is it easy. So um, it's only water. I have the Guinness waiting downstairs. I just talked for a minute about the uh, the exam syllabus. Originally, when IRTS became involved in uh, preparing the exam papers, we used the original um, SEPT. It's a TR sixty one zero two. It's a sort of a guidance for the HIRAC. It's, it's quite a long. It's a twelve page document full of mathematical formulas and the sort of one over two pi r squared type of stuff. Well, not full of it, but I mean, it includes that and a lot of technical stuff. So um, we weren't really very happy dealing with that syllabus. It, it was even difficult to interpret what, what was intended. So we did a lot of work leading up to 2010 and we consulted with Comreg and we produced our own version, an EI syllabus, shall we say, uh, that it complies with the SEPT guidance, uh, but there's a lot less emphasis on mathematical formulas, and there's more emphasis on sort of testing the intuitive understanding of can of candidates of of you know do they know how electronic components should perform in circuits? So the the multiple choice questions if you you don't have to really get a calculator to to work out the answer if you know what you know. Uh, inductors in series or inductors in parallel or whatever you know are, are going to do um, the answer should be obvious from, from looking at the, the the four choices there's you know maybe a little bit of calculation would confirm it but a little bit of calculator use but it's not that important and we also added in a column anyone who's familiar with the syllabus we added in a column on the right hand side of notes for candidates so we have the syllabus on the left hand side of the page and then we have notes for candidates that explains some of the topics in a bit more detail in a sort of a slightly more user friendly way. And then we've pulled together a lot of, of stuff that, you know, people that that's really, you know, uh, all over the place. Uh, otherwise, you know, the radio regulations and so on. We've several annexes that pull together operational procedures. And, you know, these are things that we'd expect the candidates to be familiar with. And then we also have a course guide. It was originally uh, a DVD. Uh, now it's uh, it's online. Uh, I suppose people don't have DVD players uh, to any great extent anymore. I don't have one myself. We have an online course guide that covers almost everything in the syllabus. And in fact, in the introduction to that guide, it, it says something like, well, you know, we can't guarantee that every question in the exam will be answered in, in, in this course guide. However, we are confident that a candidate who's familiar with the material in the course guide should have no difficulty passing the exam. And then um, someone, one of our uh, uh, EIs here, did a printable version of the online course guide, which is, you know, some people prefer working with uh, with, with uh, printed documents. It's 100 and whatever it is pages. And we also have a downloadable version for offline viewing. And more recently, we've the, the course guide is has been um, reprogrammed so that are uh, recoded so that it, it's responsive. It, it actually works fine on a mobile phone. The, 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 the diagrams and everything will sort of reconfigure if you're looking at it on a tablet or a mobile phone. So it's it's very, very user friendly. So um, 
I just talk about the exams in 2020. This is a bit like the, the contests in 2020. I mean, this is this is a this has been a, a, a crazy year for everybody, I suppose, in, in, in every respect. Exams are normally held here in May, June and November, December. And uh, they're usually actually held in the Comreg offices. So we had an exam scheduled for the 7th of May and that was uh, postponed. Um, we did uh, detect a sort of a significant increase in interest in amateur radio during the lockdown. So we, I decided uh, after the, that, you know, as the lockdown eased, that we would need to hold a series of exams. Um, Comrade told us their office would be closed until 2021, just to, and to forget about using it. Anyway, they have fairly small rooms that it would fit um, 20 people at most uh, uh, in a normal day, about three or four, you know, in current circumstances. So we held an exam in a hotel in uh, Dublin, West Dublin, uh, at the end of July. We had one in Cork um, last Saturday, and we have one in Galway uh, next Saturday. And for these exams, we hired very large rooms. Um, we had social distancing of three to four meters. I was conscious that you know people are going to spend two hours in you know maybe two hours or more uh, in, in 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 the room together. Uh, and in Cork, for example, um, we had we had the great we hired the Great Island Ballroom, <laughs> a room called the Great Island Ballroom, in the the Radisson Hotel. We had twelve candidates and three invigilators. Uh, and uh, on the brochure for the hotel that has a capacity for 190 people theatre style or 400 people for a reception and we had 15 so um we also had lots of face covering gloves sanitizer um i prepared the papers uh, or printed the papers um five days beforehand and sealed them in an envelope so they were quarantined and got the candidates to put the papers in a box which i then sealed and quarantined uh, and you know it's still in quarantine um yeah the, the ones from tala uh, I, I held them for five days before looking at them i suppose what we were keen to do, i mean it's pretty unusual now to have an exam uh, right now in fact one of the candidates from the tala exam wrote and said that you know he wrote to congratulations and said you know you probably actually held the first exam in ireland you know since the lockdown sort of thing so and i think that's probably true so I was determined that people would feel comfortable from a health and safety point of view, whatever about being comfortable when they when they opened the paper. And the feedback from that sort of physical uh, setup has been positive. So that has sort of helped. So that sort of that brings me to the end of, of what I had to say, Dave. Um, that is the story on the exams in EI. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I know a lot of people there uh, from Northern Ireland there have went down to do the EI exams and everything else. There's Philip raising his hand and a few others there as well. And uh, it's great that there is that avenue for people to go down and do that. My only question there, Joe, obviously, um, is it something that's maybe going to go online or you're looking in that direction um, or is it going to be no look if you want to do your exam you have to be in yeah. a certain place you know well i yeah i i mean i it, like it's, it's a solo job i i do the contest do the exams and i do the website if i, <laughs> if I have seamus mccaig works with me on the website but i like i i try to have a life i have grandchildren i have a wife Kids and grandchildren. So. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. A life outside amateur radio. Pardon. A life outside amateur radio. Oh, yeah. Well, that's yeah. I also like to. I mean, I mean if, if well, there isn't much DX or DX now, but if there was, I I might like to actually go on the radio. So I mean, it would be it it would be a resource thing in the first. I mean, uh, you know, Dave, it's a good question. It's a fair question. It would be a resources thing in the first place. I mean, I I know that. I mean, in fact, the company that does the online exams for um, uh, for the RSGB is is Dublin based, and I mean, I have spoken to them all right, um, but um, we, like we just wouldn't have the resources. Uh, the RSGB yeah. has uh, has a structure of audit committees and this, that, and the other, and quality groups and all that. Like we just, you know, if, if people sometimes they say, "Oh yeah, 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 let's do that," but I mean, you know, <coughs> who's prepared to get up and do it? Uh, it's expensive too, Joe, to get it set up. 
that wasn't a cheap system to get set up. No, and, and the numbers, I mean, I, I would say right now, because of the lockdown, that the proportion of, I mean, I, I suppose the only way of doing an exam, perhaps in the UK, is, is the online system. I, I'm not certain if that's true. But um, the if, I, I did look at the uh, figures for the exams in the UK, you, you know, the, the proportion who were doing it online. And it, it may, for the advanced, because uh, that's what we'd be looking at, I think it may have gone above 25%, but not all that much. Like we have just, you know, 40 people doing it a year, you know, so, you know, we would. You currently can't do the advanced online, but it is coming. There was yeah. a big, big uptake on foundation and intermediate. And yeah. I don't think you can book an exam now before October. They're booked, all the slots are booked out. Yeah. Take a lot of resources like, off remote yeah. invigilators and all, Joe. It's a, it's yeah. of it, at least the way we have it now, like in the normal course of events like the exams maybe takes up about two months of my life and then I have four months free see the online exams is an ongoing thing you know yeah. all the time sort of thing because people want to do them like tomorrow um, <laughs> yeah now there will be I mean I, I'm not saying I mean I know there are other IRTS people who who are actually planning to become involved in the exam thing it, it's not I mean it just so happens that following Sean's death I, I I took over the thing without complaining and it's only more recently that I've said I, like I I, I can't, you know, I can't keep this on my yeah. own. And there are others uh, uh, who are going to become involved. But even still, I don't know that we would be big enough to uh, to, to do it and, and to justify it. Uh, that's interesting what you say there, Philip, about the expense. Oh, and, and also there is the point that, I mean, we would, you know, we'd have to persuade not only ourselves, but we'd have to persuade the regulator that that this, you yeah. know, made sense and was safe. So maybe, it's it, it's a long way down the road, I suspect. Maybe have a talk with Dave Olson, Joe, and I'll either convince you it's a good way to go or put you off it totally from an IRS, IRTS point of view. You know, yeah, yeah. Dave's the man, the uh, him and Ian Shepherd, but Dave mainly would be the man. Thing. Just to ask you a quick question. You said that the first multiple choice exam come in in 2006 yeah was that june 2006 uh, january 2006 all oh, right i don't want mine in june 2006 yeah that was the the famous i can't remember it might have been sean i can't remember who else but we we done it in the letter county institute actually oh yeah i, I was up in letter county you did it there did you oh right so it was yourself and sean was it yeah myself and oh. seamus yeah seamus seamus yes yeah, sorry seamus seamus okay seamus, yeah right. i remember that <laughs> Uh, so we tried to get 10 people, didn't get 10, we only got 8. Uh, we were told we'd need 10, but he's run it on all you which we were great. Uh, we did all right, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was and, a long uh, way to go. Well, it is, but it's still part of the country, you know. No, absolutely. The people in Donegal would always complain that the people in Dublin forget about it. It's a bit like know, East yeah. and West of the band up here, you know, it doesn't don't yeah. go west of the band. But no, it's, it's interesting to see that these done one in Cork and you're doing one in Galway or I've done one in Galway because it's good to see them moving about, you know, bring, the, bring it to the people rather than everybody have to try and get the double. Yeah, the, the other thing that we did, I mean, it, 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 up to now we've generally sort of said oh, we, we do it in the Comrade office because it's it's free, uh, available to us, but that just simply wasn't on us for various reasons. So we were able to do it on, so we did them all on Saturdays, you know, uh, the final one is in Galway next Saturday and that was very popular because, you know, People were saying, well, at least I don't have to take a day off work. You know? yeah. So, so, yeah. so would the plan going forward, Joe, be to, if there was enough numbers, to move around the country? I, 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 I suspect so. I, I suspect so. I, I just don't know. And I mean, I, I, you know, a lot of people have asked me, you know, when is the next exam and where is it and so on. And I, I, feel, I feel like screaming at them saying, I don't know, because I'm just trying to get through the current... Uh, you know, well, tell Dale Wilson you'll, you'll slip him a wee five euro if he, he puts an ARTS section on the RSGB section. <laughs> you know, right. so, so, because uh, the online exams have been, Dave, you might know numbers better, but the, it's been astronomical since lockdown, the amount of online exams. Like there yeah, was a thousand, the end of, the end of July. Exam. Yeah, the end yeah. of July was the thousandth candidate for the online foundation exams. Uh, and then that since, lockdown. Just, since since lockdown began, that was. Uh, or was that the thousand? No, no, that was no, that was since the online exam started with lockdown. The remote invigilation, they're calling it, was the thousandth candidate. That was at the end of July, and then 
with the intermediate that started, as you said, Philip, it's now into your book now, and your exam date is going to be October before you can actually uh, have an available slot, and that's even before the advanced uh, or full comes uh, online. So uh, what we're actually finding now, uh, Joe, out of interest is with all the people that have got into amateur radio through the lockdown, which has been great because more amateurs is fantastic, uh, with uh, the foundation is a lot of them now are doing the intermediates along with the ones who were already foundation candidates before the lockdown began. So we have yep. even more intermediate candidates, you know, uh, taking, their, taking their exams. But as long as they start getting on the air, that, that'll be the main thing, you know. Well, Joe, just, just to give you, I, I might have told you and Seamus at the time, but the reason the 10 candidates are we of the people that went to Letter Kenny was at that time, nobody was really doing courses and there isn't still a lot of people doing courses for the advanced because it is a heavy course. And uh, basically because nobody was running courses for advanced exams, there was no advanced exams being held in, in GI. That's the reason we went down south, and, and like we were only licensed off the intermediate level, the whole eight of us. There was nobody just wet behind the ears, if you like. And I've always said, you might disagree with us, but if you're licensed off the intermediate level in the UK or in GI, and you learn a wee bit about the licensing conditions and a few of the formulas, um, go down south and do your ARTS exam. It was a quick route, but now we're online exams and the advance coming online, it's probably handy that way. When I done the exam in 2006, Joe, there was three sections to the exam. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So yeah. Why, why was it changed to two? Uh, I'll tell you, uh, there was a simple reason, actually, because it was three sections and you had to get 60% in each of the three. And I, and I just... I, I'll admit I only got 60% in, in, in section two. Well, well, we might have to section. review that now, you know. I, but I, you can't take it away. No, revoke, it was the, revoke. It was <laughs> It was a very simple one, Philip. The um, I think no one had done the sixty percent. I can't remember how the numbers were divided, but it was a, it wasn't an integer. You're like sixty percent of thirty is eighteen, so yeah. you either get eighteen or seventeen or sixteen or whatever. And um, there was some number where we rounded up, and Comreg wanted to round down. You know, in other words, the sixty the 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 sixty percent figure. You know, we said, oh, sorry, we would have said, you know, we would have rounded down, sorry, and they wanted to round up. It's the other way around, you know, yeah. so 60% of whatever, you know, um, 14 or something like that, you know, and um, we realized we had a hopeless situation. So, for, you know, after that, whenever that thing arose, and I can't remember when, we said, no, no, we'll divide it into two sections. Yeah. We also, yeah. at the same time, took the opportunity to reduce the emphasis on the theory down to the 50%, which I made, and increase the emphasis on the regulatory thing up to 50%, because the, the three sections that you had, that the theory probably would have, may have been, you know, more than 50%. Yeah, so, um, I think I think just having, if I went to do the exam now and knowing there was only two sections, I would probably not feel as much under pressure, but it, I know at the time I thought, what am I doing here? But but I got there. I got well, there. It, it, it is. It's easier, obviously. I mean, it's statistically easier to get uh, sixty percent. Uh, you know, in two larger sections and sixty percent in three and smaller sections. And that's the same year. Comrade changed to a lifetime license, where you paid hundred euro for the license instead of yeah. thirty euro a year. I remember that because I couldn't just afford when I passed the exam. I couldn't just afford to get my EI yeah. call. But I treated myself to a Christmas present and got it, which I'm quite proud of. Uh, see, it's on the screen there, and David slagged me earlier because you're on. I put it up on the screen. But my <laughs> car, car registration is EIA. It's called Papa Bravo 2 because I couldn't get my UK call. Um, so, the uh, two, two sections, do, do you feel people feel less pressured now because there's two sections? or? Well, it's been two sections now for many years, Philip. Um, but but yeah, I, I I remember in the the radio club that I am in when we um, when we reduced the three to two, and I mean I, I don't participate in any discussion, but I remember overhearing the the, the people uh, sort of saying this is much this is much clearer now and much easier yeah. to, to, to. I would to... think so. I would think so. And just just uh, I want to make a point on your. Uh, 
the talk in EA about the novice license and whatnot. I remember having a talk with our friend Derek from Comrade at an event, and he says, There's no way it's going to happen, you know. But it mightn't have just been as well said as the written version you got, but you know. He wasn't very keen then, but I know Derek would be gone. I, I would guess that is the position, yeah. I mean, yeah. things obviously change event, you know, in, in the long run, but I mean, it's the position for the near term, I suspect. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Joel, it's not a question about exam. Uh, it's more a, a spectrum question. I, I don't know maybe if you're able to answer or, or help or guide us on it. Uh, because we do quite a bit of activating and uh, EA as well as GA. We do sometimes, when well, the propagation is difficult, we do use 5 meg or 60 meters. Yeah. And uh, it's just to clarify with us, uh, I know there's different scenarios of different licensees having different access to the yeah. 5 meg or the 60 meter band. Uh, is there any short uh, sort of discussion that you could give us on which parts of it you don't go into if you're a NECA India, uh, uh, if you haven't paid the extra 40 euros or whatever it is per year. Yeah, that, that's right because, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to look at my, I have my desktop computer here. I, I might have, um, um, uh, 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 yes, I, I have the, the comrade regulation, but I'm just going to open um, just as we're talking because I may be able to address it. Um, yeah. the, yeah, I mean, we have the set, or maybe that's the wrong expression, but we have the sort of European type of uh, frequencies. I think they're available to us, to any licensee, and, and they would be available to you guys. And then in addition, there were other frequencies that, um, am I getting, there were other frequencies that we have to pay 30 euros a year for, I think. And that remains the position. Um, I'm the greatest non-expert, Ian, by the way, on that band because I've never operated in it. But I'm just trying to see if I can. Let me see now. Oh, that's okay. Okay, I, okay. Five three five one point five to five three six six point five. We have secondary allocation there, and um, fifteen watts, twelve GBW, for all modes. So that that's that's the only one. It, it, assuming your license gives you the. Uh, uh, permission to operate on those frequencies you know assuming your g license your uh, gives you permission then you can operate here on 5351.5 to 5366.5 but the other spot frequencies yeah um, and i don't have them at all because i think they're in the different document um, yeah. you would have to pay the, the 30 euros a year or whatever it is right so do you not have to have an ei license to use them i don't i, I thought i read somewhere one time that visitors couldn't use them I, I think, no, because I'm looking at a document here that says amateur station authorized frequencies. The frequency bands specified in table one below are available to both SEPT class one and SEPT class All two. Right. Yeah, no, I, that, 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 that may have been the position at one stage, but not, not since these, right. this document was published. Last year or the year before it changed that you could use. Right, but I think it originally was visitors couldn't, but that's been changed now, okay. Yeah, yeah. still a very confusing band for everybody. <laughs> that's that's true. Yes, that's true. Confusing for us still as well, uh, because uh, we can you can get caught out at the edge of the band very very easily, yeah. uh, be uh, be a kilohertz outside the band, which yeah. I was. I have to hold my hand up. I was last weekend with hot, two kilohertz. Hot, hot Master Evans, I thought you were more accurate than that. I must get you to go through that with me, Ian, sometime, because I have an 857D, which claims to do 5 megs, but any time I try to tune it, and that frequencies, I can't get it to operate. So, I don't know, maybe somebody knows in the call the 857D, is there some setting you have to change or something, but I can't, can't work 5 megs at all. But you could be listening to somebody from Germany or France on one part of it, and you can't... You can't go back to them if you do. You're illegal. You know, it, it's a very yeah. confusing band worldwide. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's horrible. Yeah. You got that scenario. I, I, like a, I take a piece of paper. I have a piece of paper or um, a note thing in my in my phone. Just tell me which frequencies I can use. But unfortunately, on Saturday, 
We were split up. We were split up, so I couldn't tell him. <laughs> he usually <laughs> asked me, am I safe on this one? Can I use it? But, yeah. yeah. Now, that, is that on the Comreg uh, website, Joe? Yeah, it would be, yes. The, the, what the document I'm looking at, Ian, is the Amateur Station Licence Guidelines, um, Comreg 09 stroke 45 R4. Uh, and it's, yeah, so it would be. And, and there, there's a link to the Comreg website on the IRTS site. Now, it, it's obviously not directly to this document, but um, this document has the frequencies yeah. that, that we generally have without any special permission. And those frequencies are available to SEPT visitors, provided within their own country they have them. Yeah. Keep the EI ones on. On there, so <laughs> the ones, the two that I know are well within the band and that you can use safely. So, I mean, there is okay, a thing. Thank am you I very right much. In, am I right in saying that in the UK, on that band or something, you can actually talk to some non non amateurs? Are they cadets or something like that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you, you couldn't do that from EI because we we can only speak to amateurs, so you wouldn't be able to contact those people, the, the cadets on there. You know, if you were operating from EI, Ian. Yeah, each year it's it's a shared band with us as well, and each year That's the uh, cadets, the um, Royal Air Force, I think it is the RAF cadet, have a what they call a, it's a blue on the air day, and they set up stations at different uh, locations around the UK. And uh, they actually then have different call signs and they encourage the amateurs to contact them. Um, we have great fun. Oh, it's actually good. four hours of yeah. solid and uh, it's a bit like a contest, Joe. So you actually get points for working more of the stations. Uh, and yeah. At the end of it, you can get a certificate of achievement as well. So it's, it's good fun. Terry, right. Terry has uh, Terry has uh, had his hand up there very politely for the last five minutes. So before he gets tennis elbow, uh, <laughs> Terry, go ahead, sir. <laughs> yes. um, just, just going on the exams, and uh, uh, this is both for um, uh, UK and EIGI. Uh, uh, are people tending to come into the hobby? Uh, and taking the exams, or are they taking the exams after they've been in for a bit and uh, got an idea of what the hobby is about? Oh, I, I well, I mean, I've, like all things in life, a bit of both, Terry, but I mean, I think, you know, um, probably when, um, when we, I'm looking at your calls, <laughs> when we got our calls, <laughs> yours is older than mine, um, <laughs> Uh, when we got our call signs, like we tended to be in radio clubs or, you know, active on the air for, for a long, long time, perhaps before or pirates. Uh, or get, getting a license. I mean, life is just different now. So I think there's much more of the um, of, of people just saying, OK, it sounds like an interesting hobby. They, they pick it up on social media, perhaps, or something like that. And um, they they do the minimum amount of work and say, well, let me get the license and um, and then I get on the air. One thing that has changed also since, you know, we would have gone on the air is equipment is relatively cheaper, you know, in, in the sense that it was always an enormous, uh, you know, I mean, I, I made my own stuff initially, but it wasn't great. So before I got the first radio that really worked and I had a growing family at the time, um, you know, it, 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 I, I was a long time around, whereas, I mean, you know, I'm not saying the stuff is for nothing, but I mean, you can get a good HF rig now, even new for well under a thousand. That, that's, you know, that's not bad in, in real terms. So I, I, I think it's more of the, um, I mean, a greater proportion than in the past would be doing the exam first and then getting into the hobby, shall we say. They just see the exam as a hurdle that has to be uh, uh, crossed, whereas we got into the hobby and then, okay, it's time for me now to get my license so that I can operate on my own. Well, that just, I mean, I, I don't mean that in a critical way. That's just, I mean, times have changed and that's, that's life now for a lot of things. I, I would just ask that somehow, what's the RSGB doing about it? I'm sorry, Phil. Um, sometimes I do wish that more people came to us uh, with an inquisitive uh, nature and, uh, um, you know, 
a, a thing to do rather than a, an exam to pass. Mm, yeah. um, the exam to pass uh, isn't, um, in my view, the best entry point in, into the hobby. Thoughts? Although yeah. there, there, there is there is the, the the beyond exam scheme now, Terry, that has started, which is sort of a yeah, pass your license and your test, and then you can win an award. I think it more or less is described as once you've completed yeah. the things like take part in a contest, help build an antenna, volunteer at your club to run a meeting, do a talk. You know, that I think that's going to be great but, as long as people get involved. You know. Uh, absolutely right, and I do applaud the beyond bit, but I would like uh, like it to be before exams as well as beyond <laughs> exams. All all of those activities are wonderful um, as an intro. How, how would you promote that, Terry? Or how would you try to do that? We're trying to do that with public yeah. events and turning up the schools and doing wee things. And the time Tim, Tim Peake was up, we were on a lot of we things in science centres and whatnot. You know. Um, I have mentioned before, and you would have heard me mention before, the airwaves thing in Port Rush, the RAF 100 and whatnot. But, you know, we're open to ideas, Terry. If you I think know, there's a good way we could, we could try and get into maker affairs and all that. You know, we do we do try and do all that. But, but yeah. if anybody's got any ideas of how the RSTB, in particular, because you mentioned what is the RSTB doing about yeah. um, That was time cheap. Uh, no, 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 no problem, Terry. Yeah. You know, there could be something that you know of or think could work that nobody in the RSTB has thought of yet. Yeah, yeah. I, I know me as a volunteer and I know Dave and others, uh, we're always open to ideas. I'm, a, I'm yeah. always willing to try new things. I'm always trying to spread it out, uh, inform people about amateur radio. And I've always said it's that diverse a hobby. There's something in amateur radio for everybody. You know, we talked about contesting earlier, certainly not contests but for me, except for the county's contest, which is good crack. It could be satellite communications, it could be hunting, it could be CW. There's, the hub is so that diverse. The, it is that diverse, but it's trying to get that audience, Terry, and how do you get that audience? So yeah. I'm, uh, openly, I'm always open to ideas. If anybody wants to text me or, or email me, my details yeah. are on the website. But... Uh, Obviously, we're not going to get much chance during lockdown and during this COVID thing to try and attract people. But I, I do understand what you're saying about before exams. You know, like that snail morse key we used at the airwaves really, really... Now, you're only planting a seed in a, in a child's head or a young person's mm. head. That may not come to futurition for 20 years. Or the time GB4 fun was on, on, the, uh, on the go. Uh, I worked in education at the time and I brought through education, where my education hat, I brought it over to the Western Education Library Board area twice, GB4 Fund Mark 1 once and GB4 Mark Fund Mark 2 second time. Now, Mark 2, we put 2,000 kids through that wagon in a fortnight in the western part of Northern Ireland. And one of the first meetings I went to as a uh, regional manager at that stage was somebody in the meeting turned around and says, how many of them became members? Oh, I near, I near exploded. So I says to them, and this, this is what the whole approach, approach should be now. Yeah. It's not about them becoming members. It's about planting the seed. We have 2,000 more young people and the teachers who, who accompanied them know about amateur radio now that never knew about amateur radio or met a new vaguely about amateur radio because most public, as we would all know, oh, is that CB? And I say, well, that is sort of, you know. Um, that's the first thing I was getting. Is that CB? Is that a CB area in your care? And I try and explain to them somewhere. So there's 2,000 young people who, who we planted. And it's about planting seed, Terry. I, I'm a big person about planting seed. I used to have a, a DR or a deputy regional manager. It was at that time, worked with us over here in Northern Ireland. And he used to always say to me, Philip, when are they going to stop stealing our ideas? And I said, Mel, it's not about them stealing our ideas. It's so about us planting a seed and see it come into futurition. Take the pleasure of seeing what your thoughts or your plan was working. It may take a while, and because it's a volunteer society, a lot of things do take a while. But I, I do get what you say about 
before exams, and I would be a big believer of that before exams, but it's, it's the right approach, it's the right audience and whatnot, and I, I'm always open to ideas, Terry, if you ever want to contact me, you know, if Listen. you think there's something we should do that we're not doing or could do better. Yeah. You know, Can I just jump in there? Um, hi, I'm Adrian, EI9HAV, uh, from South Dublin as well. Um, and first of all, Dave and the rest of your middles, I just want to congratulate you. This was an excellent session. And um, I might touch on that again in a second. Um, and I want to acknowledge Joe for the linchpin of the IRTS that he is. Um, you know, he's, he's some man for one man, which he really is at this stage. Um, just on the conversation there with Terry and Philip, um, you know, we were at the Dublin Maker Fair last year where it was 10,000 visitors. You know, it was a pretty big event and uh, Science, Found Science Foundation Ireland sponsored it. And obviously with a lot of the big tech firms in Dublin and that, there's a lot of sponsorship there as well. Um, and I think that's where it is. I think you're, you're right, Philip. I think that outreach there to plant the seed is where it needs to be. Now, our issue is that we don't have the foundation license, right? And... This is where I'm going to go back to your club. I think these outreach sessions and getting yourself out there on social media to support people in getting to know the hobby is the way to go. There's a lot of non-licensed radio hobbyists out there. You know, you can see it all across Twitter. You can see it all across YouTube. They're tinkering with satellites and space-based technologies or UHF and VHF. Um, and I think that's all we can do really is engage across as many channels as we possibly can. Um, this is a raging debate with us as well within the club. Um, and I was keen to join this tonight to see what you guys are doing in Mid Ulster. And you guys are a real benchmark example for a lot of clubs for, for what people are doing. Um, and I just want to congratulate you on that point as well. You know, um, your, your profile, the, the openness of these Zoom meetings, um, I watched your coax one on YouTube, one of your recent ones. Brilliant resource for people getting into radio. And I'm a non-technical person myself. Um, and I went through that exam hurdle. But I suppose I'm an example of someone who's from a non-technical background who can be supported by a club to get through the exam without necessarily having formal lessons or classes. Because you're just getting into that milieu of talking about radio, talking about technology, and members pointing you in the right direction. So it doesn't have to be formalized, I don't think, necessarily. It can be done through various different channels. And I think the more we reach out, I think that, that that's the way to go. So I'll Ab give it back to Dave. Thanks. Ab absolutely, absolutely, Adrian. You know, and uh, it's a team effort here with the club, you know, uh, Although Philip always says, you know, I'm the face, you know, that does the presenting and everything else. There's people in the background helping organize this and everything else there. Uh, you know, we have a good building Twitter uh, space, if you want to call it that, through the club. And that's our call sign at MN0VFW, where we have lots of different social interaction. You know, we have our, our group uh, on Facebook and everything else. But as you say, sometimes the... Uh, the best way of reaching out to non-amateurs and getting them introductions uh, is just by word of mouth. And uh, that will always, I think, at the moment, be the best way for reaching out uh, to those people for joining the hobby. I mean, the amount of people who um, I have uh, whether work with or, or, or meeting up with what have you, and I say, what's that big antenna on your car? What's that do? And I say, oh, it's from a radio. Do you have problems getting, you know, cool FM or something, you know, <laughs> and that sort of thing. Um, so that that's the word of mouth is always going to be the best outreach. Um, but with regards to us from the Mid Ulster, you know, with this Zoom stuff and everything else, this was just an idea. But we never want it to be just a club activity. We've always opened it up to other clubs and whoever wants to join. That's always been what we've about uh, and uh, I think a lot of the clubs in Northern Ireland is exactly the same it's not we're not we don't want to be just insular you know we're there to uh, meet and uh, other amateurs no matter where they're from and everything else uh, so this is a, a, a weekly thing Adrian there so always feel free you're more than welcome to come back every week or catch us on the U YouTube channel it would be great to, to have you along so 
but thank you, thank you. Okay, any final questions there before for Joe or, or before we begin to wrap up? No busting questions. I think you're off the hook there, Joe. Uh, but it's been it's been a great a great night there. Uh, you know, it's been really interesting to talk about the contests and to meet the man behind the IRTS contest. Uh, I mean, I only ever knew you as uh, an email sign off uh, uh, and every, on on the web page and everything else. So it's been great to have a conversation with you tonight and see actually see the work that goes into the contest and the the uh, exam process down in the IRTS. Um, we're big fans of the contests up here, so please don't stop them. Uh, even though there's lockdown on, please keep them going. Uh, and it's been great, great to have you along. So, thank you very much. Well, and thank you, Dave, and and the other members and the other people, the other attendees, and uh, uh, including Adrian. And I see Derek there from <laughs> another neighbour of mine, but uh, he's uh, we haven't seen his face anyway. So, uh, you know, good to see you all. And I enjoy. I was uh, last week's one. Uh, Victor's uh, presentation was the. Uh, the first one that I attended and like it was the best presentation on CW that I've seen so I mean some quite new stuff uh, and I you know I mentioned in my presentation that CW is my main mode but I mean uh, he taught me a few things new about it so like they're they're a great series and I, and I will continue to attend but I, I'll just be in, in the background uh, from, from, from here on in but uh, I, I've enjoyed it it's been great and, and the feedback was good thank you great yes great. thank you very much Joe, I only have one final request, um, or maybe this is even on the IRTS website, but I'm going to take the lazy way. Um, would you email me the, the sort of the yearly calendar of events uh, for contests, and we can stick them up on our club website, or direct me to where? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's probably, let me just see now, I, I'm just... Dave, did you did you sign up to the monthly IRTS newsletter? I sent you a link the last time. Um, now you're you're putting me on the spot here, and the recording is still going. So no, I haven't yet. Right. Uh, and I say sign yet. Up that because, yeah, no, sign yeah. up. Yet. And anybody else that's on the call, if, if you sign up to the IRTS, and it's not there, or even I, Joe, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but. Does the monthly newsletter only go out to members? It goes to members, yeah. yeah. Oh, only members, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, well, you're a club now, so just don't tell me about it. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> I, I, because I'm a member, and, and I work with Steve quite a lot, giving him wee bits of information. Yeah, sure, yeah. So yeah, yeah. No, no, it's always... a membership thing. The the, uh, the archive for up to the end of the year is on the website, freely available to anyone, but we only just update that archive every year. Well, Dave, I... I won't even have to send you an email because it's www.irts.ie stroke contests. It's as simple as that. Excellent. Say it. it's Excellent. Excellent. The, the, the calendar is obviously a little bit restricted this year because, uh, you know, because we had to cancel CW Field Day and indeed the Easter Monday uh, counties contest. So it doesn't have, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It only has 10. Yeah, because I took off CW Field Day and Easter Monday and I'll probably be taking... Uh, SSB field day off in the oh, next few days. Don't. <laughs> don't do that. Except, except, don't take that off. No, but, no. Well, thirteenth of September. Don't take it off because I enjoy the seventy sevens and two meters. No, no. I'm talking about the, the the SSB field day, Philip. All right. Yeah. yeah. I know because I mean the counties contest. Uh, okay. The, the one. Um, it, the one on Easter Monday that, that was right. You know, at the the sort of pandemic time and so on. And um, I just, uh, you know, we just weren't sure how things were going, but I suppose we're probably, you know, everywhere we, we understand the whole thing a bit. Have you, you, know, have you made me a promise now to keep the seven the same and the two natives counties contest on the 13th of September? I'll make a promise to submit a law. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do our best. <laughs> <laughs> and uh I think I think we'll leave it there with a promise from Philip to submit a log and I'll even work on it myself. So Joe, thanks again for joining us this yeah, evening. It, it, it's oh, been an absolute pl pleasure yeah. to have you along. And uh 
this YouTube should be uh, on our on our channel in a couple of days for anyone that that's, uh, wants to watch it again. And if you're watching by YouTube, thanks very much. But please do like and subscribe, and uh, we'll see you next Tuesday evening for the Tuesday night lecture series. Thank <laughs> you.